So you could say this video has been a long time coming. No matter how much I think about it, it's tough to know exactly how to start this video off. Nier Automata is a special game to what I'm sure is not a small number of people, and off the top of my head, there's almost an endless number of reasons as to why that is. I mean, a bunch of those reasons are my reasons. In an indirect way, it's a game that's kinda responsible for everything I'm doing on this website right now, which is kinda crazy to think about. Anyways, Nier Automata has been making massive waves ever since it was first released. It's a game that, in the simplest, most basic terms of what a game is, is great. It plays great, it's got an incredible soundtrack, a great story, but it's also way, way more than that. It's the kind of game where you finish it and go lie down for like 48 hours straight because you gotta process what you just saw. It's the kind of game where it has a fan base that's as active as if the game came out last week, much less six years ago. And yeah, when I say it came out six years ago, my face starts rapidly aging too. It's almost hard to believe this game came out almost half a decade ago. It's the kind of game that can bring the entire internet to an absolute goddamn standstill for weeks at a time because some dude recorded footage off a Nokia phone camera with the caption, How Get In Church Door. I mean, even though by all accounts it could absolutely have not been official, the fact that there was just enough doubt that maybe it could be should speak volumes as to the kind of personality the game's creator, Yoko Taro, injects straight into his works. I mean, a secret level skip feature was found in literally 2021, and considering the requirement to access it was so clown world precise, with that context, the whole church thing didn't seem that unbelievable. My vote was on an elaborate Unity recreation, by the way, but that was probably the best way to announce community-made mod tools. Nier Automata is a game that pushes the boundaries of what a video game is. It's a game that does things that aren't traditionally thought to even be possible, much less a good idea, but it executes them, well, pretty much perfectly. While Nier Automata is an excellent video game, it's also an incredibly important one. And I know that's a big claim, I know that sounds like hyperbole, but that's why I'm about to explain what I mean in this video. Or at least get close enough to it. So come with me as I talk about why exactly this game is so special. Why exactly this game is stuck around in the face of so many other games coming out both back then and today. Two things before we start. One is ever since its release, Nier Automata has kind of become a big franchise with collabs, stage plays, novels, etc, etc. While these are great, and I encourage anyone who's played or is interested in the game to give them a check, I won't be going over them in this video. A, because there's so much to cover already and I don't want to hold us all here hostage for like six hours, and B, because I, uh, already have gone over all of them. I've got a playlist of Nier videos where I extensively catalog and explain all the out-of-game side content, so if you're looking for that, check out my channel. Number two is it's kinda hard to talk about this game's most unique points without getting into spoilers, and everyone who's played it is definitely nodding their heads right now. So, there's gonna be two spoiler warnings. A soft spoiler warning about halfway in, and an endgame spoiler warning near the end like usual. I'll give you a good heads up before I say anything too spicy. So, with that preamble out of the way, let's get into this. I've spoken about an era referred to as the Japanese game Dark Ages in my previous videos, where in the 7th gen, stagnating ideas from the major Japanese companies, a struggle to adapt to emerging technologies, and one slotted creators shifting to a clinical, number-focused perspective, led to a solid five or so years where a lot of confidence in the Japanese side of the gaming industry was a bit shaken. Great, even fantastic Japanese games were still coming out, but a lot of the traditional mainstream players were getting in on that appeal to a Western an audience for big sales numbers poison. Which led to new entries and beloved franchises dropping out as emotionless Potemkin Village style experiences that made most people check out. While if that was the Japanese game Dark Age, early 2017 was a period I can confidently call the goddamn renaissance. Think back on it for a sec. Persona 5, Yakuza 0, Breath of the Wild, RE7, Neo. All back-to-back -back bangers all released in the same early 2017 timeframe. And more importantly, all games that were absolutely, unapologetically, quote, Japanese. Don't get me wrong, I like Horizon Zero Dawn, but sorry fellow, with this lineup, you didn't stand a chance. Funny how the line, the Japanese gaming industry is dead, became almost unheard of after this period. And it was smack dab in the middle of this period that Nier Automata would also see its release. On paper, Nier Automata sounds like the kind of game I would come up with. What if you took this niche series with incredible storytelling and world building, but literally painful gameplay, and gave it to the kings of character action combat, Platinum Games? 
It sounds almost too good to be true, like something I wished up in a dream. But to be fair, my dream game from the years 2010 to like 2018 was just Platinum Games cross literally anything, so, you know. OG Nier was great, but anyone who's played it knows its gameplay amounts to find the good move and press only that button until you win. AKA find the Phoenix Spear and press triangle till credits. Well, Nier Automata made big plans to buck that trend. On the gameplay front, Platinum Games had already proven their pedigree with Bayonetta 1 and 2, Metal Gear Rising, Anarchy Reigns, etc. So, of course, they could bring that to Nier Automata. Then, on the other side of the table, you had the former Caveat staff at Square Enix. Director Yoko Taro, composer Keiichi Okabe, producer Yosuke Saito, etc. For those who don't know, Yoko Taro is kinda like a Hideo Kojima level of auteur status, where every game he works on is packed to the brim with his signature style. And while his games are incredibly unique, they're basically the nichest of the niche. Like, I'm pretty sure the most successful one prior to Automata was OG Nier, which only sold about 500k copies over 10 years. And speaking of, Platinum Games wasn't exactly a frequent milli seller either. Despite releasing practically all of my favorite 7th gen games, Platinum never had a massive financial success. They always joked about being one failure away from shutting their doors, which is why, despite me not agreeing with their current trend chasing games as a service faff, I hope Babylon's Fall doesn't literally kill them. Sales figures aren't exactly super available, but I think their most successful game has been Bayonetta, around 2 million or so. I mean, the wonderful 101 sold like... 5? Five, 5k copies in its first week? Like, 4 digits 5k and 79k after a year? But, you know, 3 of those copies are mine, so I did my part. Yeah, all incredible games, but the character action genre isn't exactly the most financially lucrative one out there. Which is why I can say, without exaggeration, it is absolutely insane to me that as of this writing, Nier Automata, a double punch of niches, has broken 7 million copies sold. With Wonderful 101's lifetime sales of 79,000 copies, that means it is 88.6 Wonderful 101's. Like, that's nuts. Also, please go play Wonderful 101. It's really good, I swear. And it's on Switch now, so you don't got an excuse. This game has been an absolute miracle of a success. So much so that Platinum's Hideki Kamiya himself literally credits Nier Automata for saving the company. And that was back when it was only at the 1.5 million mark. Now, it's a multimedia franchise, it's got a Switch port, which is apparently a miracle port that runs flawlessly, and in about a month or so, it's getting an anime. This game was lightning in a bottle, which is why it's kind of a shame that Yoko Taro hasn't really had a big game ever since he made one of Square Enix's new household names. Don't get me wrong, I like Voice of Cards, but they don't really have the same hard-hitting Yoko Taro feel like Nier and Automata do. I think they kind of took the piss by releasing three of them in a 12-month time span, but that's neither here nor there. Look, if that's what he wants to make, I'm happy for him. I'm just saying, I'm looking forward to his next big project is all. Also, I'm settling the Automata vs Automata debate once and for all. Right here, right now. Please take a look at this two second clip. The creator says it that way, so I'm saying it that way. Expected counterpoint. He's Japanese, so it doesn't count. My counterpoint. You can render both automata and an elongated automata in Japanese, and I'm willing to believe that they at least put some thought into their game's titles, so I'm still going for automata. So now that we've established what Nier Automata is, it's time to establish what Nier Automata is about. After pressing start on the menu, you're hit with what has become a pretty iconic quote. After which you play through a short shooting section where your entire squad gets taken out one by one. You play as the sole survivor, the Android 2B, and you're tasked with taking out a machine target in this factory. Nier Automata takes place in the year 11945, in a world dominated by a proxy war, specifically the 14th Machine War. What happened to the other 13? Excellent question, my candid friend. Don't worry about it. You might think that that year number, 11945, is a bit on the nose. Well, that goes double when you look into it a bit and find out that the 14th Machine War started in 11939. Right off the bat, the game is trying to draw a parallel, or at least invoke the memory of, what we know as one of humanity's most defining conflicts. I see where you're going with this, you sly man, you. 
So thousands of years ago, aliens invaded Earth, and using their advanced machine army, they forced humanity off the planet to take refuge on the moon. But humanity wasn't exactly without a fighting force of their own. They had the androids, and to a greater extent, Yorha, the group 2B is affiliated with. These androids fight for humanity, their creators, to one day liberate their homeland and return them to their rightful place. However, like I said, this war started thousands of years ago, and it's very clear that both sides are being attritioned into a fine paste, the androids especially. They constantly receive headpats and messages of encouragement from the Council of Humanity on the Moon. Heck, even their salute references their undying affection for humanity. Everything they do is in service of this fractured ghost of humanity that they've never met, but it keeps them moving forward. It's the only thing that does. It's tied to their very purpose of creation, their very purpose of being. And that's outlined in a bunch of different pieces of side content, but it's heavy spoilers, so we'll leave that for now. After fighting through the first encounter, Tubi is nearly bested by a piece of construction equipment before she's saved by the game's secondary protagonist, 9S. It's clear that these two have definitely for sure never met before, and we get a lot of world building and personality development carried on the backs of their dialogue in this early section. The character interaction in this game is good. Like, seriously good, and you can bet this is getting brought up one or two more times in this video. We learn androids aren't supposed to have, or at least shouldn't display their emotions, something 9S is evidently pretty awful at. We get insights into Tubi's personality, like when she asks 9S to refer to her by her name instead of man, which in Japanese is her asking him not to affix San at the end of her name. Remember this funny tidbit for later. The game does a great job naturally integrating in its exposition to get the player familiar with this complex world without needing to throw 40 minutes of cutscenes at them before they even get to use Sword on Robot. Eventually, Tubi and 9S reach their target, a massive Goliath-class machine that serves as the player's first real challenge. By working together, the pair manage to barely squeeze out a W, but it turns out not to be enough, as multiple more emerge from underneath the water. Knowing they're pretty much, for lack of a better word, screwed, they pull out their black boxes, small devices every Yorha android is implanted with. They clank them together, which causes a massive explosion that destroys them and the surrounding Goliath machines, and the screen fades to black. A lot of games do a tutorial mission protagonist fake-out, something like Final Fantasy XII comes to mind, but that isn't what's going on here. 2B, seemingly unharmed, wakes up on an android orbital station known as the Bunker, and meets up again with 9S. Although, while you're still the same 2B, he isn't the same 9S. He only managed to upload 2B's data to the Bunker before the explosion, so while 2B retains her memories of the events, who 9 is, etc., to him, they're basically meeting again for the first time. A fact that seems to distress Tubi greatly. Hmm. Wonder why. And for someone who sticks hard to the emotions are prohibited line, she sure got upset when she saw 9S damaged on top of that Goliath 15 minutes ago. What's that about? If you know, you know. But what I'm trying to say is, this game is a lot of subtle details thrown in for people doing repeat playthroughs. Anyways, what the game has done here is quickly establish what exactly the rules of death are for our protagonists in the Nier universe. Obviously, as androids, they don't die in a traditional sense. Their data can always be uploaded and stuck into a new body. But that data needs to be synced to a server first. I mean, if you accidentally delete a local text document on your PC, you ain't gonna find it sitting safe on your Google Drive, if you know what I mean. Nier Automata is thematically consistent with these rules when it comes to game overs, fast traveling, etc. And it's cool how it gives context to these mechanics that most video games have, but they have them because they're a video game. Like, fast travel doesn't really have any context in your average game. It's just something you do. You close your eyes and all of a sudden, whoa, I'm somewhere else now, wow. But in Nier Automata, fast travel is contextualized by you transferring your consciousness data into another body. Again, good, consistent, thematic world building. We're already off to a hell of a start. I like when games tie the game over state into the world and narrative. I mean, it's hard as hell to do, but it's better than just pretending you went to the game over dimension and came back fine. Like, everyone remembers Hollowing in Dark Souls. Hell, they even worked getting frustrated and quitting into that narrative. But we're not talking about that game today, so we'll leave that for now. But I am gonna bring Dark Souls up again for another thing later. Back to our plot, 2B and 9S get an assignment to find a Yorha contact that's been working with another android group, the Resistance. Remember this tidbit, it's important. The pair fly down to Earth, and after a short shooting section, arrive in the game's main, and probably most iconic area, the City Ruins, the overgrown, dilapidated remnants of Tokyo. They head off towards the Resistance camp, and the game begins proper. 
Which means it's time to talk about the gameplay. Considering all the lip service I gave to Platinum Games a few minutes ago, you probably won't be too surprised when I say it's pretty damn good. A little backstory, I wasn't 100% sure I was going to get this game back in the day. I mean, I was definitely going to get it at some point, but I didn't really buy many games at full price back then. Still don't. While I thought the first Nier was fantastic, I loved its story and its characters, and considering Automata was a game set 8,000 years or so later in that game's universe, I wasn't sure how the plot thread could be drawn between the two games. Yeah, okay, I get how wrong I was now, but, you know, back then I couldn't exactly tell the future, right? That all changed in December 2016 when the Nier Automata 12016-1128 demo came out. I'm not memorizing those numbers for the line, by the way, you're getting that one wrong. I don't even think I finished the demo. I got halfway through, hit the pause button, and closed the game. I'd seen enough. I was done. I didn't need to play anymore. That brief 15 minute session told me everything I needed to know. I booted up my PC and pre-ordered the game on Amazon, back when they were doing the 20% off all new game pre-orders thing. Anyways, Nier Automata's gameplay is pretty standard platinum fare, with a few unique twists thrown in the mix. You've got the expected light and heavy attacks, ranged attacks, dodging, the works. Character action games are like fighting games, which is why they're a different genre from beat-em-ups, by the way. Don't at me. You're incentivized to maximize the amount of damage you can do per opportunity to deal damage that you have, if that makes sense. While you can create multiple opportunities to deal a small amount of damage at a time, there's no matching that big dopamine rush you get when you pull off big combo. To this end, Nier Automata outfits you with multiple combo strings, including mid-combo weapon loadout switches you can use to keep the momentum going. Nier Automata also has a relatively high emphasis on ranged attacks from your companion pod. You can hold down the right bumper for a pretty much endless string of bullets that'll cancel out enemy shots as well as deal damage, or press left bumper for a powerful attack that goes on cooldown. As for defensive mechanics, Nier Automata sports a pretty hype dodge mechanic. You can hold down the button to extend the dodge into a little drift, and if you dodge at just the perfect time, you'll get an opportunity to do a counterattack, which feels... Mm. I wrote smack slips in my script, but to be honest, I feel a little gross making that noise, so uh, I'm just gonna say it. Smack slips. The window is a bit more generous than you'd probably expect it to be, and there's no cooldown on how many times you can dodge in a row, but that doesn't really take anything away from the feeling of satisfaction. In fact, I'd say it's even more satisfying when you pull off multiple of these dodges in a row. So yeah, the basic combat is relatively simple, but as expected of a Platinum game, there's a high skill ceiling. I think the perfect example that illustrates this philosophy is your ranged attack. You can fire while locked on, but that increases your bullet spread, so while you won't have to worry about aiming while throwing out your regular attacks, you're not outputting optimal damage. On the other hand, if you're not locked on, you have to keep your reticle centered on the enemy, but the bullets come out in a perfect straight stream. This trade-off between precision and ease of use is an example of one of those small, almost insignificant, but really smart ideas that shows how much thought the developers put into the combat system. Overall, battles are an intricate dance between you and your opponents, and are really fun and satisfying, which is important considering how much you'll play this game. Platinum Games games are designed to be replayed endlessly, as you're always striving for a better rank. Nier Automata swaps out this character-based approach for a more RPG-style structure, so while you probably won't replay it solely for the gameplay sections as much, it is factually bulkier than the average character action game. And when I say it has an RPG-style structure, that's because it definitely leans on the RPG part of the whole action RPG thing it has going on. It incorporates leveling up into its mechanics, which might seem like a strange choice for a genre that relies so heavily on a precise balance to create a challenge. One small nitpick I have for Nier Automata is that it does suffer a bit by being unable to give the player this precise balance. Normal difficulty is, and this explanation is going to sound like it's fresh out of a fever dream but stick with me, too easy when it's easy, and a little bit tedious when it's not. You probably won't be challenged too much on normal difficulty, what with there being a feature to auto-use healing items when you get low and being able to outpace the main story's level by just slightly veering off the main path every now and again. Okay, you're thinking, there are two obvious solutions to this. The first is to play on hard difficulty, which is something I too would normally do, but Nier Automata's hard difficulty feels almost like a mistake in how hard it is. It's less Metal Gear Rising normal versus hard, and more like Devil May Cry normal versus Hell in Hell. Okay then, solution two is just to purposely underlevel yourself on normal to increase the challenge. But this doesn't increase the challenge as much as it just increases the time it takes to kill enemies, which will eventually start making things seem tedious. 
And also, you know, you'd miss out on the side content. It feels bad in the same way hard difficulty is sloppily implemented in a lot of other games where hard just equals bumping enemy numbers up. It doesn't up the feel-good reward from overcoming the increased challenge as much as it just feels like wasted time. Maybe an RPG system is just fundamentally at odds with tight action-focused gameplay. You could certainly argue that's true. The Wonderful 101 doesn't have any XP bar for a reason. But then I look at the Souls series and how they can consistently provide what feels like a perfectly balanced challenge while also integrating RPG mechanics. Is it a hard balance to strike? Yeah, probably a super hard one. So I can't really fault Nier Automata for not getting it perfect. I want to clarify, it's not that the game consistently feels way too easy, it's just that there are some points where you can't help but think that something should have been a little harder than it actually was. Which is enough to rob you of a little payoff. While it may seem like I'm harping on this point a lot, let's put it this way. If the biggest criticism I have of Nier Automata is that the difficulty balance is out of whack sometimes, that should put into perspective how much other stuff this game nails absolutely perfectly. That said, there's one criticism with Nier Automata's combat I hear a lot that I take heavy offense to, and that's the claim that it's too simple. That it doesn't have the depth that other Platinum games like Metal Gear Rising do. And that's kinda true. While you do have light and heavy strings, integrating them together usually only has a single finisher per weapon. And while it does have a few button combinations like jump immediately followed by light attack for a launcher, it's definitely a lot less than Platinum's other dedicated character action games. Yes, overall, if you line the combo list and button combination moves of Bayonetta and Nier Automata side by side, it'd look like Automata pales in depth by comparison. But that statement alone requires putting like 16 asterisks beside it and willfully ignoring a bunch of other mechanics. To properly put Nier Automata's combat in perspective with its character action game peers, I replayed the Bayonetta series, Wonderful 101, and made the MGR video earlier this year, so I'd have a complete image in my mind to draw off of. I mean, now that I'm looking at it, literally every single video I made this year except for a single one is either an action RPG or an action game, so uh, really showing off my tastes here. First off, I think a lot of this simple gameplay misconception comes from a misunderstanding of weapon combo levels, which is a little fair because the game doesn't outright explain them to you. Aside from leveling up your character, you can also upgrade your weapons in Nier Automata. Upgrading them provides you with a stat increase, standard stuff, but it also does a few other things. The first is it unlocks a piece of that weapon's story, which are usually some super well-written short stories that are a standard part of a Yoko Taro game. Some of these are genuine good pieces of writing that hammer home a particular point or theme. I really like Cruel Oaths in particular. When you start near Automata, the combos might seem a bit simple, and that's because by leveling up your weapons, you unlock further combo paths with them, as shown by their primary and secondary weapon levels. Only having a two-hit combo that looks like it's lacking a finisher on your secondary weapon seems lame, but that's because you're meant to level it up to develop its combo string. So if you didn't know about this system, which from keeping up with six years of Automata discourse it seems like not a lot of people do, I think it's easy to miss it and assume that's all you get. Which also leads into another unsung hero of the combat variety, the amount of weapons you have at your disposal. There are four main weapon types in the game, Sword, Greatsword, Lance, and Fist. Each of these weapon types has a different combo string depending on if you equip it as a light or heavy weapon, which comes out to eight separate distinct strings. But in addition to that, remember that single mix string I mentioned earlier? That's different depending on the combination of weapons you have equipped. I'm not good at math, but that's a lot of different moves, and considering you can swap between two loadouts on the fly as easily as Dante can switch weapons in Devil May Cry 5, I'm not quite sold on Automata's combat being as simple as people make out. Which leads to my last point, the chips, which is where Nier Automata's combat goes from varied to IDK my man, just do whatever you want. In Nier Automata, you can equip a loadout of chips to your character. These chips can have a variety of different effects, from straight stat upgrades to entirely new mechanics. With these chips, you can create your own variety of playstyles, no matter how gimmicky they might seem. You want to do some fringe, high-risk, high-reward counter lifesteal builds? Go for it. You want to spec full into ranged attacks and play the game like third-person Ikaruga? Yeah, sure, if you want. Hey, you want to literally have Bayonetta Witch Time? I know I sure as hell do, and there's a chip for that. If you need to learn how to talk to a lady, ask your mom. You want to be Raiden and use parries as your defensive mechanic? Why the hell not? I bet there's even some weird-ass tech from the Activision-licensed Platinum TMNT game in here. 
I could go on and on with this, but my point is, while on the surface, Nier Automata might not seem like it has the depth of a lot of other Platinum character action games, the playstyles of each of those games are pretty much all found within Nier Automata. Also, I gotta ask the age-old question. Can 2B dodge offset? The answer is yes. Alright, I'm sold. Automata's solid gameplay definitely keeps it feeling good from start to finish, and if you're getting bored of the same playstyle, you can basically turn it into a different game. The only thing that could improve the experience is if the game had a ranking system, but I know I might be asking for too much there. It's just too open and encounters are too frequent, it would be hard to design a ranking system that works for everything without making it feel tacked on. I just love ranking systems, you know? There's gotta be an action RPG out there with this kind of structure that has a ranking system, but none are coming to mind right now. Let me know if I'm missing something in the commentos. The thing with these chips, though, is that you lose them on death. Well, sort of, at least. Like I said, this game establishes very early some specific rules about how death works in this setting, and that isn't just for story purposes, it's the same for the gameplay as well. If you get a game over, you leave a Dark Souls-style body behind, and if you recover it, you get your chip set back. If you die on the way to that body, which is, uh, a lot more likely since you have to do it without your loadout, then they're gone. Like, gone gone. If I had to say one mechanic feels a bit out of place in this game, it's this one. You can also pick up the bodies of other fallen players. When other players die, they leave behind a body and message in your world as well, and you can either retrieve them to gain some money, health, and limited access to their chipset, or revive them to have a little AI buddy follow you around for a bit. Again, I had it in my head that I didn't really get why this mechanic had to be here. Was it just because it was the hashtag style of the time? When it hit me, that it thematically makes a lot of sense to be finding these other Yorha androids out in the world. In a setting that involves a basically endless war, it makes sense that the Fallen would be strewn across the battlefield, and it makes sense that when you find them, you literally use them as tools. This war isn't about the individuals anymore, it's only about what use they can provide. When I stopped seeing this as them trying to copy the current trends and thought about what they were trying to say with this mechanic, I gotta say, I get it. That said, mechanically, gameplay-wise, I don't think it's got a great implementation, and I'd say recovering your own body is a bit badly implemented, TBH, especially with the chip permaloss thing, but I see what they were going for. Speaking of hashtag trends of the time, structure-wise, I've seen Nier Automata described in a bunch of different places as an open-world RPG. I don't really agree, I mean, it kinda is if you look at it from the right angle, but the Platinum Games website says it's an open world RPG, so I don't know, maybe I'm the one that's full of shit. It's structured in a very similar way to how the first Nier is, which is structured in a very similar way to how something like Zelda Twilight Princess is. You got your big open hub area that branches out into more linear side areas, which you'll go through as part of the main story. I wouldn't call that an open world, but I've clearly been outvoted here. But let's go back to the first thing I said. No, not the long time coming thing from the intro, the thing I said about Nier 10 seconds ago. The reason the way this game is structured feels so much like Nier is because, fun fact, it's the same world, or at least has parallels to it. You'll probably see what I mean if I point it out, but the factory is the junk heap, the desert is, uh, the desert, and so on. One of Nier Automata's strengths is that its world has such a strong sense of personality. You feel like you're experiencing a story just by wandering around it, which is helped a lot by the character dialogue. I could list a bunch of examples to try and convince you of my point, but let me just move the queen into a checkmate position. I think I just have to say the words, 2B and 9S's conversation about a t-shirt, and everyone who's played the game that's watching right now will immediately know how strong Nier Automata's ability to turn a simple in-game area into an interesting plot point is. And you're gonna get used to Nier Automata's world, because you'll be seeing it a lot. Optimistically, you can call this smart level reuse. Pessimistically, you'd call it backtracking. I'd say Nier Automata leans on the better side of this. Sure, you go back to areas a few times, but it's never usually like the same place multiple times in a row. You get a good variety as you play out the main story, but of course, sometimes a developer can't account for exactly where and when a player will visit different areas if they stray off the main path. And you know what that means. Because, of course, what would a hub-based, not-open-world, open-world RPG be without side quests? Because of Nier Automata's structure, which we'll talk about in a bit, the pace you get these side quests is kinda lopsided. It can be a bit overwhelming the amount of side quests you get at, like, the 4-hour mark of the game. 
You get access to most pretty early at basically the same time, and the game shows you all available side quests on your map as well. Your map will fill up with red dots faster than if you jumped in a swamp covered in honey. It can be a bit of a sensory overload. I'm not gonna lie, I was kinda tired of open world game style side quests by 2017. A lot of games would stuff themselves with boring, throwaway, cookie cutter side quests made to dump truck a bunch of halfway worthless items on the player and pad out runtime for a back of the box quote. Over 50 hours of exciting gameplay! Yeah, how about I take a one off your game score for every tower I'm forced to climb? It was because of this late 2010s open world fatigue apathy that I made the small brain decision in 2017 that maybe I don't need to bother with Nier Automata's side quests. Then, back in 2017, I did one side quest and was like, okay, that one was good, but surely the next one can't be that high quality again. Then I did another one and I was like, okay, but surely the next one. Okay, but the next one. All right, fine, but the next one can't be. All right, I'm not gonna lie, they're not all bangers, but a lot do a good job at telling a compelling short story to the player. I mean, the setting is perfect to do just that. Like how about this one? This android asks you to help him pick up some chips. You found out he's stealing them from Yorha, but you can choose to let him have them anyway. Then, later, you find out it's because he's obsessed with having a family and use them to build a little son. While you can empathize with his desire, it's kind of unsettling the way he went about it. His creation begs you not to inform Yorha about what he's done and let them live in peace, but you can't be sure whether or not it genuinely feels this way or if it's been programmed to. Or how about the pacifist machines that disconnected themselves from the network and are encountering for the first time what it means to be an individual? It's hard to truly reach a mutual understanding with another person, especially if you only learned what those words meant like a week ago. There's this one quest where a robot mother drives her son to run away. As you escort him back, he tells you about his real ass, almost human struggles, and when you reunite them, they say maybe two people can never truly understand each other. But that doesn't mean they shouldn't try. The side quest even has an alternate ending if you mess up and let the kid die, and it's, uh, not exactly a happy ending. Anyways, one of my faves is a side quest about the robot who pretends to be stupid to hustle people. I like him. He really speaks to me. To sum it up, if you're gonna play Nier Automata, don't skip the side quests. At least, like, 85% or so are well worth your time. The team said their inspiration for the side quests came from The Witcher 3, and my sense of time must be running backwards, because I almost did a double take when I realized The Witcher 3 came out two years before Nier Automata. And that design goal makes sense. The Witcher 3 has some substantial ass side quests. I just looked a few up and was like, wait, that was a side quest? I could have sworn that was part of the main path. The entirety of Last Wish was optional? The conclusion to the Bloody Baron storyline was optional? Bro, what were they thinking? Do they know how many people might have missed that? And ding ding, that's the point. Like The Witcher 3, Nier Automata isn't afraid to let you miss content. It had enough confidence in the player to let them seek it out. Too many games are so terrified of a player missing something, literally everything substantial will be shoved into the main path. Which sounds fine, but that usually means the side content is exclusively populated by, well, garbage. Starting to make sense why I was so exhausted by open world side stuff when Nier Automata came out, huh? I get it. Games are expensive. Single side quests can cost tens of thousands of dollars in worker hours to produce. It's hard for a developer to imagine that something they painstakingly created might only be seen by a small percentage of players. But the thing is, Nier Automata's side quests work because they're not pieces of throwaway content that were made because, quote, this genre needs side quests. They're compelling and well-written in their own right, and the way they're presented, as, you know, side quests, mean they can tell their own story without interfering with the game's overall pacing. As for visuals, well, this game had to run at a solid 60 frames per second on the PS4 and Xbox One, so some sacrifices did have to be made. I think the most noticeable graphical foible is the texture pop-in. Sometimes you have to practically nose-kiss a wall before the detail decides to show up. It's not a deal breaker, but like, you literally cannot not notice it. Also, by today's standards, the visuals don't hold up the best. It's really noticeable in the low detail on the foliage and the rocks in the desert. The resolution on consoles is low, but don't even get me started on the whole PC debacle. Where to get proper graphics settings, you had to download a mod to fix it, until they finally patched the PC port in July of 2021. You know, only a solid four years after release?
The patch totally broke the game if you had the previous mod installed, by the way, but that kind of sounds like a me problem. Okay, did you get all that? Good, because that's pretty much all the complaining I have about the game's visuals and music. Some concessions to hit 60 frames per second on console, and a slightly busted PC port of a Japanese game from 2017. Which, to be fair, means it's an above average PC port of a Japanese game from 2017. What this game lacks in raw visual fidelity, it makes up for an incredible visual design, which in my book is the better of the two. I've already gushed about the environments, but the distinct color palette of each one really makes them stand out from each other. The cold, sterile black and whites of the bunker, the lush greens of the forests, the rust-stained browns of the factory. There's even a slight color filter that displays over your character whenever you go into a different area. I also really like the liminal space feel of areas like the copied city and the tower. Hey, that's a thing that's trending right now, right? The design goal for the environments was to make them feel like places in the real world, despite being places that don't exist in the real world. Nier Automata had a ton of artists hard at work to make sure not only the world design was perfect for the setting, but the characters were as well. And yeah, the character design is pretty on point. You could go like, why make Android have big bum? And you're not wrong, but focus here. Nier Automata Android ass is the gateway drug to an existential crisis. You heard it here first, quote me. But I love how the designs of both the Yorha androids and the robots convey so much about the world. They're full of these minor touches that really make them stand out. And I mean, their designs have basically become iconic. All you need to see is the cloth visor, and there's nowhere else for your mind really to go. Put on the blindfold to hit the pinata? More like sick Nier reference. Happy birthday, Timmy. I like how the robots have a very clear Emil from Nier Replicant design motif. But you've also got some really complex ones, like the leader of the pacifist faction Pascal, where you can clearly see the mechanics that govern his movement at work from behind. And that's not even to mention the attention to detail that went into this game. I love how the weapons float behind your back and seem to act almost independent from your body when you swing them. My favorite thing is how your character will have a different animation for returning to their neutral stance depending on what attack you end a combo string in. Considering the amount of weapons in this game and how different each animation can be, you can tell a lot of work went into this. If you slow down the footage and just watch the attack animations play out, you can tell how intricate they are and how your entire moveset has this kind of flow to it. I know, I'm gushing about simple stuff like animation, but this is where Platinum Games really shines, and I appreciate it. And speaking about gushing, it's time I talk about the music. Technically speaking, it's some of the best and most unique sound design in gaming. Metal Gear Rising might still be the king of in-fight dynamic boss battle music, but the way Nier Automata implements its dynamic soundtrack is fire as hell. Each track is kinda like a layer cake. First you have the foundation, which is usually a low-key, subtle backbeat. Then, as what you're doing changes, it'll start adding new layers and new instruments to that foundation, completely changing the feel of the track. Then finally, when shit really hits the fan, the track will get lyrics added to it, and it just feels so good. The lyrics are in a made-up language, but I'm sure if you've played the game, you can picture exactly what they sound like in your head. So yeah, technically speaking, the music is great, and the way it's implemented was really smart. But none of this matters if the music isn't good. So that's the big question then, isn't it? Is the music good? Now look, a bit off topic, but I'm gonna get real with you all for a second. If you've watched some of my pre-game retrospective stuff, or have been around this channel from the beginning, it's no secret that this is a bit of a high-pressure video. And the thing is, right, I can't remake a video. Once I press upload to put it out, that's it. I've got one shot to do it right and tell the narrative about this game I want to tell, to convey my thoughts about it to you, the audience. If I remember a massively important point a week after upload, that's it. I've got to sit with that forever. If someone drops a comment and I'm like, oh man, I can't believe I forgot to talk about that, then I gotta hold that L for life. I'm not trying to garner sympathy or anything, it's just, you know, reality. It's a fundamental part of video making. So for a long while, I wondered whether or not I should even make this video. Whether or not I even could make this video. If I could properly shape my thoughts to talk about this series in long form and do it justice. I always think, what if I miss some integral detail that made it stick with me so hard all those years ago? Or even worse, what if I know what that detail is, but it doesn't hit the me of today the same way? I think these are relatable worries that can apply to pretty much anything, not just video making. The thing is, it's true, I had all these thoughts in my head. But then, I legit listened to 5 seconds of any song from this game, and all of a sudden, every reason why it's so special, every reason I love it just comes flooding back. 
I remember after uploading the binary domain video, before I was 100% sure I was going to commit to this game, I came across a clip of the song Kaine Salvation on Twitter. Yeah, not technically from this game, but it is in this game, so don't get at me, it counts. All I had to do was listen to 30 seconds of it, and I was like, nah, I remember exactly what made this game so great. We're doing this. It's so unlike anything else. It's the ultimate memory trigger. The way the robot chanting is integrated into Birth of a Wish, the upbeat yet somewhat sad sound of the City Ruins theme. I even like the dumb supermarket remix of Emile's theme he sings when he drives around. By far, my favorite clip from the soundtrack is from the Japanese version of Way to the World. Where at the very end, the way Marina Kawano delivers that last... Book. Like she's literally on the verge of tears? Incredible shit, man. Hits you like a punch to the gut. I used to listen to that track at the gym, and it always got me to push out that one extra rep. Of course, this music is all made possible by the Dream Team at Monaka, headed by longtime near composer Keiichi Okabe. Fun fact, a Monaka is this Japanese snack, where it's usually a zuki bean paste, but also a lot of the time ice cream, surrounded by these two wafer things. Would recommend. Another fun fact, Keiichi Okabe and Emmy Evans, who did a lot of vocal tracks for Nier Automata, did the soundtrack for... uh... Some Japanese early morning soap opera, of all things. Look, if I gotta bear this curse knowledge, now you do too. So this is where I drop my soft spoiler warning. What I'm about to talk about is like, a fundamental thing about Nier Automata that I'd be genuinely shocked if someone didn't know about in current year around our sun 2022, but, you know, I ain't trying to ruin anyone's day, you feel? Skip to here if you don't want to know what happens in the first half or so of the game. Wonder what the percentage on that one was. At least you're still here. Yeah, you. Anyways, you head to the desert area where you find a bunch of machines that are, um... Doing things that you wouldn't expect machines to do, let's put it that way. 2B and 9S don't really question what's going on though, they just pull out their swords and start junking the little toasters en masse. <laughs> After defeating a handful, a bunch of machines combine to create a new machine that looks suspiciously human. After killing it, another machine bursts out of its chest, making 2B and 9S flee the scene. After a bit more exploring around, you find out that the aliens, the android's enemy number one, have been dead for thousands of years. The machines have gone rogue and turned on their masters, now being led by Adam and Eve, the two humanoid machines from the desert. Similar to Near Replicant, this game can be cleanly divided into sections. The desert, fighting the boss robot Simone in the theme park, taking out the Engels robots in the city which leads you to finding the aliens, heading to the forest where you fight against a kingdom of robots and meet the enigmatic Yorha runaway android A2, but it's heading to the flooded area of the city and fighting the massive kaiju robot Grun where the story takes a big turn. 2B is separated from 9S, who's been brought by Adam to the underground copied city. Adam is obsessed with humanity, what drives them, their purpose for existence. He comes to the conclusion that humanity was driven by violence, and it's only by disconnecting himself from the robot network can he risk his life to truly feel what it means to be human. You can't exactly blame the guy. T-5 seconds after being born, you, a Yorhai android in the closest current analog to humanity in his eyes, immediately started throwing wrists, so whose fault was it? Fundamentally speaking, he isn't exactly wrong. Life being given meaning by death is a common theme in philosophy, and that's one way to interpret what he's saying, but that's neither here nor there. What is here and there is that this gamble doesn't play out well for him, and 2B kills him and rescues 9S. After one more return to the factory to meet a group of cultist robots, a section that contains some of my favorite scenes in the game, <laughs> the machines connected to the network all go berserk at the same time from Eve's grief from losing his brother Adam. 2B and 9S manage to put him down by hacking into him, but 9S gets infected by Yoko Taro's favorite side content get out of jail free card, if you know you know, the logic virus. This means 2B has to end him herself. It's not death, per se, but remember the rules this world established about an android dying. 9S can't upload his infected data to the bunker, which means while he will survive and be remade, it won't be the him he is now, the him who has memories with 2B. The self being separate from the body. 2B finishes the job and drops a curious line, it always ends like this, before it's revealed that a part of 9S's consciousness was left over in the machine network, meaning he's fine. All's good, credits roll. 
You might be thinking to yourself, that was pretty good, a solid game, but you might not really see why people love it so much. Yeah, sure, it was an engaging story, but nothing mind-blowing, a bit short all in all. And there seems to be so many questions left unanswered. What happens now, with the aliens being dead and all? What about A2? She seemed like a major character, but you meet her, like, once. I'm willing to bet that there's some people out there who hit these credits and then put the game back on the shelf forever. But no, no, we're not even close to done here. When the credits finish rolling, you get smacked with this screen. Nier Automata aggressively encourages you to do a new playthrough. Now, you might think this is optional. It's not. I'm not asking. The game isn't either. I know, this isn't standard, but by the time you hit credits on ending A, you're not even like 30% done with this game's major plot revelations. For anyone who's played a single Drakengard or Nier game before, they know what the deal is, but Nier Automata is the first one to be so... heavy-handed with asking you to hit that new game button. Like, hey, haha, you really want to hit that new game button signed at the bottom by Square Enix PR, not the game's director Yoko Taro? I'll bet the execs at Square Enix were like, listen here you robot head motherfucker, we are not spending 16 million to let you make this game just to have the majority of players only see a quarter of it. The ending thing seems like it's a bit of a hurdle for some people, and that's because, on paper, it doesn't sound like the most enticing concept. I've spoken to people who are like, yeah, the game looks good, but I don't want to play a game I have to beat four times. Technically, Nier Automata has 26 endings, but other than A to E, the rest are joke ones, but that's not really important. Although, I'm sure we all know someone who's gone an hour without saving and then eaten the fish. It was me. That, that someone was me. Ending K, everybody. Yes, you have to roll credits on Nier Automata five times to finish the game, but I think the point that should be emphasized is that you're not doing the same thing every time. I mean, calling them playthroughs almost feels like a misnomer to me. It's more like you're playing through a game and the credits pop up midway for some reason. After Route B, you see a cutscene cut like a trailer and you're like, okay, Nier Automata finished, this must be setting up for a sequel or something. No, just hit that continue button again, that's still this game. For simplicity's sake, when describing to other people how Nier Automata handles its endings, I always use the Resident Evil 2 analogy. Route A is Leon A, Route B is Claire B, and then Route C is like popping in Resident Evil 3. And speaking of Claire B, it's time to talk about a part of the game I've seen a lot of people claim is their least favorite. Route B, aka the 9S playthrough. I think the dislike for this route comes down to two things in particular, and I'll address each and how I feel about them. The first is the gameplay. 9S plays a little differently from 2B. Instead of having heavy attack strings on the triangle button, he can instead hack into enemies. This plays out like a little shooting game, where you have to play as this ship and shoot down a few enemies and then a core. If you succeed, the enemy you hacked will explode in an AoE burst that damages other enemies nearby. If you hack an enemy that hasn't noticed you, you can either take control of it directly or subjugate it to have it fight for you. These shooting sections might seem out of place in a third-person character action game, but the Nier series has had a long tradition of flirting around with multiple genres. I mean, who can forget the literal Diablo level from Nier Replicant, and basically half of Automata is a shooting game. I'd say the two gameplay styles are mixed together pretty well for the most part, but I'm not gonna lie, the grun shooting section drags on a bit too long. That shit exhausts me. Anyways, the main complaint is that because hacking is a hard start and stop from the regular gameplay, it breaks the pace of fights. On top of this, without having a heavy attack button, Nidus' moveset is simpler overall. But I gotta defend my boy Nines here. Despite having a gold medal contender for the worst dodge attack in a game where you're frequently dodging, I don't think it's fair to call his moveset brain dead simple. Yeah, he doesn't have a heavy attack button like 2B, but he has something 2B doesn't have. Pause combos. This, combined with, again, being able to switch between two weapons on the fly, I found 9S's moveset to be pretty substantial. Not quite as complex as 2B, but you also play as him for a relatively shorter period. As for whether the hacking minigame is a pace breaker, I can't say 100%. The best I can do is list what I liked slash didn't like about it and let you come to your own decision. I think it's great as a quick cut to a different style of gameplay. I like how when you use it, you get an 8-bit rendition of the song that's currently playing in the background, no matter what that song is. I dislike how it's essentially a get-out-of-jail-free card. 
You can spam it against enemies that are way above your level range, and as long as you're even half decent at shooting games, which I am not and could still clear them no problem, you can basically win any fight as long as your patience holds out. It's great when you pick out an opportunity where an enemy jumps into the middle of a crowd of its homeboys, you hack in, then it blows up half the room. But it's not great when you're just rehacking the same boss for the eighth time. Part 2 of the criticism towards the 9S playthrough is that it's the playthrough in the game that shares the most similarities to the one that came directly before it. It's the only playthrough in the game that repeats events. You're just seeing the same events through 9S's perspective, so it stands to reason it would be the most similar and the one that's most likely to feel like you're doing the same shit over again. But Nier Automata doesn't just cheaply throw a second playthrough at you to pad out runtime, the whole game was built with this structure in mind. No shit, right? But let me tell you what I mean. If Route A presents you with concepts, Route B is where you're made to understand those concepts. Like how 9S has to be told by 2B not to call her 2B-san again, because to him, they're meeting for the first time. Like how the actions you took during 2B's boot sequence didn't say they were being recorded for the funny meme, they were actually recorded and are played back to you on this playthrough. Like how robots won't attack you until you attack them first, a direct callback to how shades aren't aggressive to you until you attack them first in Near Replicant. It's just they're portrayed to the player as an enemy, a threat, so most people won't notice and immediately go in. It's a video game, that's the bad guy, swing the sword, what are you waiting for? Even A2 isn't hostile to you until you make the first swing. That is, unless 9S chooses violence. There are chests you can find during the 2B playthrough that have seemingly no purpose, but you subconsciously tuck a little mental note of their location somewhere in the old brain cave. Then, you find out you can open them as 9S. It's a subtle way of getting you to pay attention more to the world around you. You notice even subtler stuff, like how 2B and 9S are sent to Earth to investigate the disappearance of a Yorha resistance contact, and how that plot thread gets... um... forgotten? Like, I paid extra attention this run through the game just to make sure, but uh, <laughs> no, I, I think Yogotaro forgot that one on the drawing room floor somewhere. That, and while the 9S playthrough is similar, it's not the same, and while that sentence sounds like I've misunderstood what a thesaurus does, it's actually an important distinction. Even the camera perspective difference when 2B first meets 9S seems to highlight this change. There's new content. I mean, 9S isn't with 2B the whole time after all. He was off doing his own stuff at some points. Even the character interaction dynamics are different. 9S has a different operator from 2B60, who is, uh, totally Moe, by the way. <laughs> <laughs> While 2B is the stoic one in contrast to 6O's bubbly personality, the 9S210 dynamic is basically the opposite, with him trying to evoke emotion out of her and basically hitting a brick wall. One of my favorite interactions is when 9S replies to her orders with an emphatic, Hi hi, and she tells him that he only needs to say it once, which he responds to with a dejected, Hi. The 9S playthrough also doles out this new content at a pretty good pace. Every milestone in the main story pretty much equals a new scene. Even though a lot of the playthrough itself is mostly similar, you still have these hooks that draw your interest as if it were all new. You might worry you have to complete all your side quests during the 2B playthrough, but the ones you finish stay finished, and the ones you didn't are waiting right there for you when you hop into 9S. In addition to that, there are a lot of 9S exclusive side quests. Like this one where you hack into a robot that's disconnected from the network and struggles with the meaning of life. And who can forget that side quest? You know the one. Red Hood. Knowing what I know now and seeing how 2B reacts to it, whew. A quick aside, for this video I aim to finish the game with the highest completion percentage reasonably possible. The last time I did the majority of the content outside the main story was my first playthrough in 2017. Now that all the books, drama CDs, stage plays, music videos, etc. have been released, I was actually kind of surprised by just how much of that stuff was already in the game itself. You don't need to watch Butai Yorha, it's all here. Even Play-Doh 1728, the doll-loving machine from the music video, is found in a weapon story. Like, a new image came out recently for the anime of a character named Lily, and I saw people calling her a character from Butai Yorha. I'm not gonna argue particulars, but uh, here she is, in the game and everything. In playthrough B, there's also a lot of new scenes featuring the robots and their backstory, a la what Near Replicant did with its shades on playthrough B. 
You learn that while the robots are the enemy of humanity, they also have human qualities like desires, wishes, hopes, dreams. You learn they desperately try to mimic humanity, playing out their political structures, societies, relationships. It's almost like they worship humanity, more so than the androids who've sworn eternal fealty to them. The robot kingdom in the forest is just trying to raise a new king to be like the one they lost. They don't understand that as robots, they can't age and grow, meaning they literally cannot have dynasties and royal families. They're just mimicking what humanity did. Also, fun fact, the forest robots speak with a Hokkaido accent in Japanese. A fun little detail that's hard to carry over in a localization without sounding too heavy-handed with it. You get more insight into Adam and Eve and why they're so obsessed with humanity. You get other scenes about other boss robots. For example, the boss robot Simone is the way she is because of unrequited feelings. She desires attention, love, admiration, and is willing to go through any lengths to get it. And uh, believe me, these are some really unsettling lengths. And this is told through, of all things, a visual novel section. Plot-wise, these can feel a little strange. It feels like there was no thought of, this won't playtest well with the average player, we should optimize retention by doing this and that. It feels like a game where the creator was left to their own devices to make the game they wanted to without thinking about optimizing the experience for maximum mass market penetration or something. It's, in a word, unapologetic, but at the same time has this uniqueness that can't be found literally anywhere else. And maybe that's why the Nier series sticks out to so many people. Doing stuff like this is a quick ticket to making your game niche, yeah, I mean Nier and the Drakengard series barely sold. But then, you have Platinum Games on Automata delivering the banging gameplay to lure more people into the series, to get them to experience something they might not have otherwise. Or maybe it was the 2B ass doing the luring. I guess Android ass and top tier action gameplay are the gateway drugs to an existential crisis. And the thing about the visual novel sections, right, is that the writing is so strong, you don't give a shit that you're just sitting there reading text on a page. Like, okay, there's this one visual novel backstory that you can only access if you talk to the right NPC at the right time that has no quest marker or anything indicating that you should do so. The literal definition of missable, low-priority content. I'm a fast talker. I purposely slow my voice down when I record for a video because one, no one wants to hear a guy going a mile a minute liaisoning every second word, and two, I know English isn't everyone's first language, so I want my voice to be easy to pick up. Sometimes I forget to slow it down and it's noticeable, but, you know, no one's perfect. The point is, I'm a fast reader too. I can skim dialogue pretty quickly, probably to an annoying degree for anyone who watches my videos that feature text dialogue. I'm not telling you this because I've lost my mind and have decided to go on a tangent or some kind of D-tier flex. I'm telling you this because right here, you can clearly see in the footage that I physically pause while reading through this visual novel section because the writing has just dropped a brick on my chest. Without experiencing it for yourself, I can't quickly describe why the writing in this game is just so far above the level of most others. It just hits and nails it every single time. They even manage to make the relationship between A2 and a floating garbage can feel extremely compelling. This game does things that games just don't do. Things you'd think games couldn't do. I'll talk about that point specifically when I get into the ending, but how's this for things games aren't supposed to do? Nier Automata lets you buy trophies with in-game money. Like, for real. If you have a friend who brags about having the Platinum Trophy slash all the achievements, check their timestamps. If something don't add up, call them out. Tell them I sent you. Don't, uh, don't check mine though. Uh, of course I did it legit. Who do you think you're talking to? So, uh, where, where were we with all this again? Oh, oh right, playthrough B. Overall, I think it's an integral, extremely important part of the game as a whole. That said, I also do think it would be fair if someone said it's the roughest part of the game to get through. I wouldn't change anything about it myself, but it's what lies beyond Playthrough B that elevates Nier Automata to a game deserving of the status it holds on to today. And speaking of things games don't do, I think it's time to tackle the big one. I'm not exaggerating when I say that I could not have seen Nier Automata's success coming, even if I had them Doctor Strange see all the outcomes powers. What's here should legitimately be the nichest of the niche, but it managed to resonate hard with a mass market in the same way the rest of the games in its series did with their respective niches. The Drake and Nier games have never been mass market successes, despite their unique take on storytelling and themes. 
I mean, studios have sunk around them. Rest in peace, Kavya. Even thinking what it must have taken to get Nier Automata greenlit, like, it makes me wonder if there was a hostage situation or something. But Nier Automata's success is in no small part due to the game's director, Yoko Taro, and his absolute unique way of storytelling. Obviously, it was a big effort from a bunch of different people, but he's kind of the face of the series, pun intended, so I'll refer to him. You can read articles and interviews about his inspirations for his storytelling process, and it legit sounds like it came from another universe. I mean, we're talking about the guy who, when developing Drakengard, watched End of Evangelion and was like, Damn, that was a good-ass movie. Then he went into the office the next day and was like, Alright fellas, this is what we're doing for Ending E. The staff were like, haha, good one, funny joke, but then he went, Yeah, yeah, joke, hmm. This is what we're doing though, for real. And need I remind everyone that that's the ending that led to the entire Nier series. We're talking about a guy who told his team, I'd like to give Nier Automata a happy ending, and they spent the entire development waiting for him to say psych. There's so many complex themes presented in this game, but unlike most, it doesn't feel like it's just trying to sound smart. What if Robot Think They Human is like the first sci-fi plot ever conceived. I mean, Blade Runner came out 40 years ago this year, which is based on a book that came out 55 years ago. These aren't new concepts. But Nier Automata doesn't take that concept the same way it's been done so many times before. Nier Automata does something different. It's hard to describe the feeling, but I'm human. You're human. I mean, I assume you are. Can't tell how far bots are progressing these days. Nier Automata does such a good job at presenting its themes, you kind of feel out of body, which is what the game is going for. You see these themes of humanity and you're sitting there like, do I do the things that make me human? Literally, all I know how to be is human, but do I even know what that means? Am I even good at it? I'm not trying to be deep. The game is designed to make you question what it means to be human by showing you the struggles of characters coming so close to it, but missing one or two critical things. Doing something wrong. Something you and me must have. Something we, in the real world, do right. Right? The theme of the game is the Japanese word agaku, which means to struggle. Side note, I was gonna sound all smart and make a cool reference, haha <laughs> Skull Knight and Berserk calls Guts Agakumono, but when I went to fact check myself, turns out I misremembered it and he actually calls him Mogakumono. Literally a synonym, but whatever, fine, don't let me have that one. It do be that way sometimes, I just wanted to share my failure. Both androids and robots struggle to find a meaning in life, a reason to keep going. Once the robots disconnect from the network and become individuals, they lose their absolute single driving goal, and what do you fill a hole like that with? Maybe it's the androids that have the biggest hole to fill, but I'm starting to realize, I can't keep dancing around these topics without getting into spoilers, which leads me to this. To make my last points, I can't hold anything else back, so this is the big spoiler warning. From this point on, anything is fair game. Again, skip to this timestamp if you're still planning on playing the game for yourself. Alright, we're all in. At the end of playthrough B, the truth is revealed to you. Humanity, aka the android's sole purpose for existing, is gone. In fact, they've been gone a long time, and they're never coming back. Now this is a knowledge check to see who played Nier 1. If you finish that game, you know humanity was, for lack of a better word, fucked, and that their extinction was a foregone conclusion. But, the androids don't know that, and specifically, Yorha doesn't know that. In the side content, there's a story about a faction of androids who wanted to live for themselves instead of just existing to serve humanity. This thought is so hostile to the main android faction that they drive and exile these separatists to the single most inhospitable, dangerous place on the planet. Queensland. I mean, it's only kind of a joke. They do drive them to Australia. That's how dependent the androids are on the mere shadow of humanity's existence. And that bomb has just been dropped on 9S, a member of the most humanity-dedicated android faction, Yorha. But this isn't the first time he's heard this information. It's only the first time this him has heard it. I mentioned a certain side quest Tubi has a certain reaction to, and that side quest has to do with an incredibly secret Yorha model, the Type E series, short for Executioner. 9S is too curious, too good at hacking and scanning. No matter what happens, he'll always eventually find out that humanity is gone. It's when that time comes, 2B, or as she's better known, 2E will have to kill him. And she'll have to do it over and over. Remember the line at the end of playthrough A. It always ends like this. 
There's also a bit of foreshadowing to this after A2 fights the robot in the desert. We're just witnessing another spin in this cycle, the only thing is 9S doesn't know about 2B's true identity yet. But maybe he's catching on. When 9S is captured by Adam after the Grun fight, you get to see one of Nier Automata's most infamous lines. You're thinking about how much you want a 4 asterisks 2B, aren't you? This line works on so many levels, it's almost fourth wall breaking in its directness. Like, are you asking 9S, or are you asking me? Cause, uh, I, I can't answer that question right now, your honor. It's really tempting to think, haha, four asterisks, must be the naughty word, teehee. But the word is left ambiguous for a reason. After beating the game and looking back, you realize how many verbs would be a viable option here. Kill, save, free, hurt. The complex nature of 9S's relationship with 2B means there's no right answer to this, but he'll never get the chance to do any of it. When Playthrough C starts, the androids launch a final invasion of Earth, an all-out attack to reclaim humanity's planet from the robots. But things don't go as planned. The robots utilize an intentionally placed backdoor in the Yorha servers to infect every android with a logic virus that makes them turn on their allies. Yorha was always destined to fail. It had to, to keep the lie of humanity alive. There's this one really gut-wrenching moment when you return to the bunker and are fighting off your former comrades, and you realize one of the androids you killed was Operator 6-0. Eventually, 2B falls victim to the logic virus as well. She reaches A2 and asks her to take the memories from her sword, the last records of her existence, before Mercy killing her. The only thing 9S sees from afar, though, is A2 pulling her sword out of 2B's chest. Routes C and D happen simultaneous to each other, with A2 picking up the pieces 2B left behind, and 9S working to open the newly formed machine tower with the help of androids Devila and Popola. These routes are pretty straightforward, but there are two standout events I want to talk about, one in C and one in D. The first is that due to the influence of the tower in N2, the machines in Pascal's pacifist village go berserk and start attacking their friends and family. A2, who's gradually growing as a person and realizing machine doesn't automatically mean enemy, possibly due to the influence of 2B's memories, helps him evacuate the children to the factory. A2 helps fight the attacking robots off, but is hopelessly outnumbered, which is when you take control of the game's technical fourth playable character, Pascal. You box out an Engels in this poorly controlling set piece they love so much they stuck it in Bayonetta 3 as well, and then you walk back to where you left the children. And they're gone. Pascal taught them fear, a human emotion, because he thought it would keep them safe, but instead it had the exact opposite effect. Compounded with the literal loss of everything he built and the people he loved, imagine the guilt Pascal must feel, especially since he believes what happened in this room was his fault. So he turns to you and gives you an ultimatum. Delete his memories, or destroy him. What is the ethical option here? If you delete his memories, without the knowledge of why what happened happened, it might happen again. But then, is destroying him the right answer? There is no right answer. Especially when you consider that there is a third answer. Just leave. Despite being mechanical, Pascal is, for all intents and purposes, alive. He will hate you for not giving him what he wants in the moment, but is the death of the self via memory erasure, or the loss of existence from destroying him, really the right answer? Like I said, there is no right answer. If you leave him, in English he says, A2, how could you? In Japanese, he says, A2, uramimasu, which is a really powerful hate, like, I resent you. It's hard to hear those words come out of Pascal, a character you've known for the whole game, one you know would never say that to anyone. But it just goes to show how having everything taken from you can really change someone. The next thing is in Route D, 9S gets Devila and Popola to help him open the tower, which they can do, but it'll cost them their lives. This one is for the near one players in the audience. You get a flashback via visual novel scene telling us what happened after the incident with the Shadow Lord. Devla and Popola units were the standard android meant to oversee Project Gestalt. Well, they sure shot the bet on that one. After the incident, the remaining DNP units were literally programmed to feel unimaginable guilt over their failure to protect humanity. And as a cherry on top, they were pretty much ostracized from all of android society. 
the Devil and Popolo we meet are basically the ones that get the best treatment, and they're pariahs who have to do all the worst jobs. The androids, who almost chose to cease existing rather than to find a purpose to live that didn't involve humanity, found their scapegoats, and with that, all DNP had were each other. But these two got to be together until the very end. They got to choose to be. My mind always goes back to that one scene from Nier. You know the one. No one stops. It's way too late to stop. That one hits me every time I think about it. Was it their guilt that led them to throw their lives away to help 9S? We'll never know, but in their last moments, they were together. And maybe, in some way, they managed to save humanity after all. And then 9S fights a bunch of Replica 2Bs, gets his arm cut off, and decides to replace it with one that's swimming in Logic Virus juice. Great idea. We're in the endgame now. A2 comes face to face with the entity you could probably call the leader of the machines, N2, aka the red girls you can see hanging around the background of a few cutscenes. They're sort of like a representation of the machine network. Since the machine network has consciousness, it's basically infinite. It can spend eternity learning, so it chose to evolve. The twist is that this entire war was orchestrated by them. They could have won at any time, but by keeping the androids alive, they could keep the world in a state of constant war and use that to evolve. Adam said the machines killed their masters, the aliens, because they were stagnant, almost like plants. So, how do you beat this infinite consciousness? Well, you do nothing. You let its consciousness multiply until it fractures and it begins to disagree amongst itself. Also, they say, I see a light. After A2 is free from their trap, you do a double boss fight with 9S until both androids arrive at the top of the tower. Let's check what we're working with here. 9S's logic virus up, was kinda losing his grip on reality anyways, just found out a fundamental part of the androids, their black box was machine made, and oh yeah, hates A2 for thinking she killed 2B. A fight is inevitable here. You choose who you want to play as, and depending on who you pick, you'll get endings C and D respectively. In ending C, A2 sacrifices herself to remove the virus from 9S and save his life. And in ending D, A2 and 9S kill each other, but 9S is given a chance to enter the machine network as they launch their data into space. So, we're done here, but Yoko T promised a happy ending, and neither of these are particularly happy endings. Also, you might be wondering, is ending C canon, or is ending D canon? Well, it doesn't really matter which of these two is canon, because once you clear them both, Nier Automata does something I can definitively say no video game has ever done before. And I'm serious. So you've beat both endings and you're watching the credits like usual when the pods start talking. They say Project Yorha is complete and their mission is over. It's bittersweet and as a player you can't help but feel a bit of emptiness in your chest over the outcome these characters got. Then, all of a sudden, the screen pauses, and Pod 042 says, I have come to the conclusion that I cannot accept this resolution. Stories end, and sometimes those endings aren't happy ones. But a story that invokes a genuine feeling of sadness from a player is just as powerful as one that invokes any other kind of emotion, happy ones included. Media has an incredible power to present literal made-up shit to us and give us the opportunity to live through it, to feel the emotions as if they were our own. But you can't choose these emotions. You can't choose how a story ends. The author does. You simply get to experience it. But this time, right here in Nier Automata, you're being given the opportunity to choose. Pod042 asks 153 if she hoped they would survive. He's not asking the pod, he's asking you. You're being asked, can you accept this resolution? And of course, you say no. Ending E begins. You control a little ship like you have so many times before, and you start playing through a shmup segment with the credits. The music's playing, and you're on the edge of your seat, because assuming you haven't been spoiled, there is no precedent for what's going on here. You have no possible way of knowing what's coming next. If this is you, by the way, trust me, turn off this video and go play the game. Like, right now. Now, it doesn't matter who you are. It doesn't matter if you can one coin clear a Karuga, or do a no-bomb run of Embodiment of Scarlet Devil on Lunatic, you will lose on this shmup stage. And you will lose a lot. You'll lose so much, you might think you weren't meant to beat it. Like, this is all some joke about how futile it is to struggle against fate. I mean, that'd be pretty on brand. But after you die a few times, something changes. You get these messages from other players. They all tell you how they were where you are now, and that you shouldn't give up. They're cheering for you. 
you specifically, and you keep losing and you keep getting more of these messages, every time the game asks you to give up, you tell it, no, you won't give up. Everyone is here for you, they want you to succeed, but you can't. Their words aren't enough, it's action that matters. And that's when the game asks, will you accept someone's help? And when you do, everything changes. You're surrounded by other ships, your firepower is multiplied, and what seemed impossible before now seems completely doable. You're plowing through the credits, and whenever you take a hit, a message comes up on the side of your screen that a player's data has been lost. The messages start to increase, and the music swells, becoming a multi-layered vocal track consisting of the different language versions away to the world. You feel like you're a part of something, and it's absolutely indescribable. It is 100% emotional manipulation, in the most literal meaning of the term. Your emotions are being manipulated by the game, by the author. This part of the game is like a goddamn switch. No matter who you are, you will feel something in this moment. I'm seeing it for like the 15th time and it still hits me. And then, just as quick as it came, it's over. The music stops and the scene fades. You see the pods fly out into the distance, carrying parts, until the camera zooms up on who else but 9S and 2B. The game ends on a somber message, that maybe it won't have been worth it. Maybe everything you did was all for nothing. Maybe you did it all just for the same result to one day happen again. But those are all just maybes. It's just as likely that something different will happen. After all, the future isn't just given to you. It's something you have to take for yourself. And just before the screen fades out, you see A2 perched on a windowsill. They have a chance to live, and while it's not exactly a happy ending, it's definitely a hopeful one. Unless you dig too deep into the side materials, which, uh, let's not spoil the mood. To finish off, the game asks you one last question. Those messages saying that other players' data was being lost? Each of those people gave up their save file to help you, and now the game is asking you if you'd like to do the same. You don't have to, the game makes it clear that you've just unlocked a bunch of new stuff for completion, and there's a chance that your save file would go to help someone you absolutely hate. This also raises a lot of logistical questions in my mind, like what about the literal first person to reach the credits, who helped them? But you know, I don't think we'll ever get an answer to those questions. Whatever, let's not ruin it. If you choose to delete your save file, you get the chance to leave a message. After all your data, save files, and records of you playing this game are gone, that message serves as definitive proof that you were here. That you existed. I shouldn't have to say this, but games, like, don't do this? They're not supposed to be able to do this. This is a way of turning the fundamental mechanics of video games, like save files, etc., into a never-before-done kind of storytelling device. Which is why I think this mechanic should be put on the back burner for a while. Sino Alice, a mobile game directed by Yoko Taro, is ending service soon, and it's ending by giving players the option to delete their saves. Everyone is like, whoa ho ho, Yoko Taro at it again, the funny head man, but the reason it was so special in Nier Automata and Replicant is because it was just that. Special. I'd hate to see it become run into the ground by becoming the trademark gimmick or something. Anyways, we're running a bit heavy on time, so with all that out of the way, I think it's time to wrap this up. It might not be an exaggeration to say Nier Automata sent a ripple down the gaming landscape significant enough that we're still feeling it today. There just isn't much out there that meshes the unique take Yoko Taro has on storytelling with the ace gameplay of a Platinum game. You know, a non-Babylon's Fall Platinum game. With everything from stage plays, to novels, to music concerts supplementing Nier Automata's already thorough and fantastic story, it's easy to see just how much of a success this game was for Square Enix. It's hard to tell at this point just where Yoko Taro and the Nier series are going to go from here. I don't think anyone expected Nier Automata to get announced, but the time between the first game and Automata was about seven years, and we're, uh, just about pushing that on the amount of time it's been since Automata released. I guess if you count the Nier Replicant Remaster Remake and Nier Reincarnation, it hasn't actually been all that long since the Nier game came out, but, uh, yeah, I've done my time in the Nier Reincarnation mines. I'm good. I'm free. The Drakengard games are unfortunately pretty hard to access in the hashtag modern era, so while it wouldn't be the most exciting announcement in the world, a Drakengard 123 HD collection would be welcome. 
I mean, I'm not gonna stand here and lie to you by saying they're even 1 100th as enjoyable to play as Nier Automata, but maybe if Dragon Dragoon 3 had a consistent frame rate, it'd be tolerable. Who knows? And as I'm writing this paragraph, I think I've come to the conclusion in my head I was looking for. The reason that, despite their flaws, the Drakengard games plus Nier 1 have such a following is because there's nothing else really like them. Nier Automata not included on that list because it has significantly less flaws, but it's there in spirit. There's nothing quite like the Nier games. There isn't really anything else out there that scratches that specific itch. There are imitators, games that pay homage, and games that have been inspired by them, and some of those games are great. But they're not quite the same. And maybe that's okay. Because it's that specific thing that this series has that brings everyone to it. It's probably what brought you here, right here, however many minutes into this video. And you know what? I wouldn't have it any other way. As much as I love playing good games, nothing beats a unique one. And when that unique one just so happens to be good as well, that's the part of the Venn diagram you'll find me in. As always, a really big thanks for watching. I wouldn't be able to be here talking to you all like this today if it wasn't for the people who watch my videos. If this video gets, I don't know, 100k likes or something, I'll record a karaoke cover of the Japanese version of Way to the World. You think that's a joke, but I'll do it. Anyways, till next time.